There's a lot of people in our culture who make money their God. Let me tell you something. You can have a bazillion dollars in your bank account, but that money will not visit you in the hospital. It will not comfort you when you need comfort. It will not bring you peace when you need peace. It's just a material object. It's nothing. Today we're in 1 Samuel 5, so if you guys have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there. Um, if not, pull your tablets out or your phones out and uh, look on there or play your game for the next 45 <laughs> minutes. I don't know. I'll think you're reading your Bible. How about that? We are in 1 Samuel 5. We're working our way through this book. This has been a great uh, study so far, not because of the speaker, but because of the text, because of what, what we're learning here. And what we're learning in this book is... Up to this point, we have learned a lot about how God speaks to us. Um, We started the book in chapter 1 with this woman uh, named Hannah. That's kind of the theme of the early book, which is this woman named Hannah who is barren. She can't have any kids, so she begs God to give her a child. She kind of makes an agreement with God. God, if you'll give me a child, I'll give that child back to you. And the whole theme is that God hears her request God answers her prayer and gives her a son. She keeps her into the agreement. She brings the child to the temple and uh, gives the child back to God. But God heard her prayer. God interacted in her life. Then we came to chapter 2 and we see Hannah's prayer, but then we also kind of end the chapter somewhat negatively because there's this guy named Eli who Eli is uh, a, a, he is a preacher or he's a prophet or he's a priest, more accurately, who is totally... Uh, abusing the priesthood, and and I think that you know sometimes people get turned off by by uh, Christianity because because they find out that the pastor or the preacher or the church leader is a hypocrite. Um, you know, I, I just you see that all the time. People like to use that argument, but I think more than anything, what you need to remember is this: that uh, God knows and God sees, and there is. Uh, I think, deep punishment for those who name the name of Jesus and use it to abuse people or use it to take advantage of people. Um, And here is a kind of an example of that, where here's this guy named Eli who has two wicked sons. He doesn't do anything about his boys. And God speaks to him. God sends a prophet because here's a man of God that's not hearing from God. So God sends a prophet to Eli and he says, punishment is coming. And Eli, his response to that is, oh, oh well, you know, what's going to happen is going to happen. He doesn't repent. He doesn't change. Um, And so we see God speaking to him. And then then we get into chapter 3, and we see God speaking to Samuel. So you have this little boy who has a tender heart for God, and God speaks to Samuel. And the word of God begins to come through Samuel. So that's what we see uh, God interacting with this, this boy. And then Four is the tragic story we read last week about how Eli dies, the Ark of the Covenant is taken, and the Philistines now have the Ark. So we come to this short chapter in chapter 5, and we see that the whole theme of this chapter is that the Philistines now, the Philistines are, let me talk a little bit about who they are. The, The Philistines are, they are not Canaanites, so the Philistines, it's not their land, they're, 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 they're sea people that have come to Canaan, but this is not their land. They're kind of in the land of promise or in the land of Canaan, and they're enjoying the blessings of God, but they will not acknowledge God as their God. So this is who the Canaanites are, and these are the ones that have the ark. So they have a multitude of gods. Their most famous god is a god named Dagon. And what they try to do here is they, believe, they, they have reverence for the Israelite God, but they don't want to give up their gods. So what they try to do is, is they try to have two gods. So they put the ark, which is the symbol of Israel's God, in with their God, Dagon. And what they're really trying to do is, is they're trying to have two gods. They, they want to have multiple gods. Well, if we know the Ten Commandments, which what's the first one? You'll have no other gods before me. See, God doesn't operate that way. God's not kind of like, well, you can have multiple gods. God 
wants all of your reverence or none of your reverence. God wants all of your attention or none of your attention in the sense that there's no, you can't have multiple gods. So this whole story is about, is God trying to get the Philistines to abandon their God? Now, it's very applicable to us because I believe that we live in a culture with a lot of people trying to have multiple gods. There's a reverence for God. Like, you go to a ball game, and, uh, and in particular, uh, like in New York City, I know, for example, uh, when they do the seventh inning stretch at the Yankees games, they sing, God bless America. God bless America, right? Land that I love. What do we sing? Stand beside her and guide her. Blankety blank, give me another beer, <laughs> right? So we live in a country that acknowledges God, but really doesn't want to make God Lord. We don't want to make him the supreme God. So this is very applicable to us, our country, and... Um, And this is what the Philistines are dealing with. So this is God. So God spoke to Hannah. God spoke to Eli. God spoke to Samuel. Now God's going to speak to the Philistines who don't really want anything to do with God. So what happens? So verse number one, then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Now Ashdod, the Philistines had five major cities. Uh, One of them was Ashdod. And it says, verse 2, when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. So let's talk about this foolishness of multiple gods. So number one, we see the first thing, the first kind of foolish, the foolishness of multiple gods is one, men try to make other gods equal to God. Men try to make other gods equal to God. So let me describe Dagon to you. Dagon is a... Is a uh, Well, if you have a woman that's half woman, half fish, we call it a mermaid. So Dagon would be a man-made, I guess. I don't know. It's it's half man, half fish. I don't think that's correct. But uh, a mermaid of the male kind, I guess, is what it is. And that's what Dagon was. Dagon was half man, half fish. So the upper part of his body was male. The lower part of his body was fish. And this was the god. This is their god that they had, Okay. So they bring the ark in there, and they, they bring the ark into the temple of Dagon. And th- they see the ark as a beaten deity. They see the God of Israel has been beaten because we conquered the people of God. We killed 35,000 of their men. Now we have their great symbol of, uh, of, their, of their God, and we're going to put it in with our God. They have a reverence for him, but they will not worship him. You know, it reminds me of the, of the verse in Romans where it talks about that, that they, they look at what we do, they look at our reverence for God, and they see it as foolishness. You know, the cross is foolishness to the world. Um, the, the, one commentator said this about the, is, about the Philistines. He says, they, they said they will not bow the knee, but they will tip the cap. Like, I have great reverence for this God, but I'm not going to bow the knee. And this is what they're doing. They're, they're trying to uh, have two multiple gods. It's called idolatry. And men have done this since the beginning of time. Remember what Joshua said to the Israelites when he came into, uh, the, when they had taken the land of Canaan. And this was kind of his final speech. This is what Joshua said in Joshua 24, verses 14 through 16. Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. And this is, idolatry is trying to have multiple gods. God says, I am to be worshipped alone, or I am not to be worshipped at all. And so, the first thing we see is, they're trying to have multiple gods. And this is 
uh, very common in our, our culture as well. So what does God do then? How does he try to get their attention? First of all, or n- number two, God tries reason. So you have these gods, and they have multiple gods, so God tries reason. So let's look at what happens. So they put the ark in with Dagon, verse number three, and when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. So this is exactly what happens. So Dagon's a pretty good size God, pretty good size image. So they go, uh, they go home, they put the ark in there, they go home, they come back the next day, and Dagon is laying face down in front of the ark. Now, who did that? God did that. He's trying to subtly get their attention. Look, this is just a nothing. This is a nothing God. I am the true God. So he tries reason with them. Because he's saying, how smart is it to worship a God that needs your help to stand up? So I got to go back in and pick my God up and set it back in its place. How, he's trying to get them to think, how smart is it for me to worship something that I have to help up? We see the patience of God here, trying to get them to see that he is the true God and Dagon is a false God. And we're so grateful that we have a God like that that's patient, right? But the reality is, a lot of men see the signs of God, but refuse to acknowledge God. Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You cannot honestly look at the sunset and the sunrise and look at the mountains and look at creation and say, this just all happened. How did this... Everything that is created has a creator. So it's just inside of us to say, this is made by someone. And this is, it's revealed. It's, uh, you know, I think of the first people that orbited the earth, the first astronauts that orbited the earth. What did they, what did they uh, recite as they're orbiting the earth? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first people that were in space were like, man, this is, A God thing. So this is what Paul is talking about. That God is revealed through his creation. God is revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. You cannot argue that Jesus was not a real person. Jesus was real. He walked on this earth. He claimed to be God and he rose from the dead. It says, but this is what Paul says, but... Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they become fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-feeted animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creator rather than the creator served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever amen you know what i hear over and over and over uh, as i watch the news is man we have ticked mother nature off we have ticked mother nature off so we don't acknowledge god we say that we've ticked mother nature off we worship the create the creature rather than the creator God speaks to us in all kinds of ways, does he not? You ever ever had an event in your life and it's like, okay, God was speaking to you. I mean, it was obvious. There's no pain. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody suffers. But it's obvious that God is trying to speak to us. God speaks to us in all kinds of ways. 
He does it through nature. He does it through friends. He does it through events. He does it through circumstances. Like we think that things happen in our life that are random and, they're, and they just, but there's no random stuff. God allowed us to interact with this person that we have a uh, encounter with who then we, we see God in a circumstance or God in something that's said. And this is how God speaks to us. And this is what he's doing here. Your God is impotent. It is useless. It, is, it has no power in itself. All God had to do was go, and the thing fell over. And it couldn't get itself back up. Remember, what the, remember when um, Elijah took on the prophets of Baal? And remember him taunting the prophets of Baal? He says, hey man, maybe Baal's taking a nap. Maybe he's out for a walk. Why? Because Baal is nothing. God tried, and this is what he does. So they walk in there, and they see their God laying down in front. So are they going to acknowledge that, that Israel's God is the true God? No. They set it right back up, and they go right back to worshiping Dagon. So what happens the next day? Verse 4, And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground. So they set it back up. They have their worship service. They come back the next day because they're They come back early because they want to see, did Dagon make it through the night? And they get there and he's, he's on his face. And not only that, but the head of Dagon and both of the palms of his hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. So now not only is he on his face, but he's chopped in half and his hands... And his head's cut off. Number three, God shows his power over the other gods. Dagon is powerless. He can't even defend himself. Now notice, so he falls apart and he goes on the threshold. And verse five says, Therefore neither the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. Rather than them um, seeing that, that Israel's God is the true God, they kind of double down on their God. This is bizarre. Dagon, what, what God is showing them, the Philistines, is your God is powerless. He is impotent. He cannot do anything to defend himself. So uh, the writer in Psalms talked about this in Psalms 115. He says this, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the works of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feel they have, but they do not walk, nor do they mutter through their throats. Those who make them are like them, so is everyone who trusts in them. See, there's a lot of people in our culture who make money their God. Let me tell you something. You can have a bazillion dollars in your bank account, but that money will not visit you in the hospital. It will not comfort you when you need comfort. It will not bring you peace when you need peace. It's just a material object. It's nothing. Your house will not wrap its arms around you in your time of need. It's just a thing. But we lose our ever-living minds. And instead of worshiping the true God, we worship money. We worship things. We worship power. We worship influence. These are the things that we make as our gods. And what God does is God breaks those things down and we still don't get it. He shows his power over them. He destroys their God. He destroys our gods. This is what happened in Israel. This is what happened in Egypt with Israel. Remember, there were 10 plagues that happened in, in, uh, Israel, in Egypt when, when God was trying to get the, the Egyptians to let the Israelites go. Do you know every one of those things that happened 
were idols that the Egyptians worshipped? Like they worshipped the Nile. So God said, let me do this. Let me turn your Nile into blood. They worshipped frogs. So God said, let me give you so many frogs, you're sick and tired of them. He showed his power. Every act in Egypt was, I am more powerful than your gods. But what they never relented. If, if all of these things, like if, if, if money is the true God and it's, it's the thing that we should pursue and power is the true God, shouldn't all of these people that have all of this money and all of this power, shouldn't they be the happiest people in the world? Shouldn't they be the most content? The people that live in the biggest houses, shouldn't they be the most satisfied? But this is what we, this is what we live in our cult. We try to have two gods. We, we get things mixed up. See, God gives us objects to enjoy life. It's not bad to have money. God's not against having money. But he, is, he has a problem with it if I take the money and put it above him, you see. Or pos- God gives us possessions to enjoy. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. But man loses his mind and puts the, the things, the objects above the creator. So what does God do? He has to to get our attention, he has to go after those things that we long, that we have put above him. It's like sports or, or entertainment is, is an enjoyable thing that God's given us, but people put that above God. They've lost their minds. So what does God do? God has to show his power over the other gods. So God has to break those things down to get our attention because we have put them above him. And this is what he's doing here. He says, look, I gave you a subtle message. I laid the thing down in front of me. You ignored it. So now I'm going to break it up. It's going to be obvious that this thing just didn't tip in the night. So how did they respond? They they doubled down on it. They said, nobody's going to go on the threshold because that's where Dagon fell. Instead of acknowledging the true God, they doubled down on their God. So then what happens in verse 6? We see the third stage. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So number four, the fourth step is God then brings personal pain. C.S. Lewis said that God whispers to us in pleasure. He shouts to us in pain. Now, there's a lot of debate about what's going on here. Um, There's a couple of of thoughts that happen here, or there are a couple of thoughts of what's going on here. Um, Some people believe that it says, notice what it says, it says he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, or the tumors is swellings, it would maybe be translated. Uh, There's a lot of people that believe that this is the beginning of the bubonic plague, that uh, some people believe that that's kind of, this is the start of it, the bubonic plague. And if you got the bubonic plague, 50% of the people who got the bubonic plague died. Uh, There's another thing that, there's another belief that uh, they got hemorrhoids, which that's kind of its own level of discomfort, right? But he's bringing them personal pain. But we do know that there was a lot of people dying. And uh, if you go to the next chapter, they, uh, if you go to chapter 6 and you read verse 5, it says, it talks about, uh, therefore you shall make images of your tumors and images of your rats that ravage the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from you, from your gods and from your land. So what a lot of people believe is, is that, they make these images of these rats because they, since, since the Philistines will not acknowledge that it is God that is taking care of them, providing for them. Because remember, what are they? They're people that want to enjoy the blessings of God, but they don't want to acknowledge God. They don't want to bow the knee, they just want to tip the hat. And this, tip the hat. So this is why they put Ashdod and the, uh, and the Ark of the Covenant in the same room. 
because they have reverence for him. So God says, if you won't give me reverence, then I will cause my creation to turn on you. So I'm going to raise up rats that will eat all of your grain, that will then infect your society, that will infect your culture with disease that then brings on the bubonic plague. Can God create rats to eat all of the grain? Sure he can. God can do whatever he wants. So this is what he's doing. He's trying to get their attention. He's given them a subtle message by laying the ark, laying the uh, Dagon down in front of the, of the Ark of the Covenant. They don't get that message. He then breaks their God up. This is, this is where you see a lot of people come to God because they've spent their whole life pursuing this God. Then their life falls apart. Then they come to God. God so they got the message, but they're not getting the message. So what does God do? As a third and a final and a last resort is one of personal pain. He's like, look, if you won't get my messages, then I'm going to personally touch you. I'm going to bring pain on you. So this is where God gets a bad rap because like God's just, he's this vengeful God and he just wants to, he just wants to hurt people. No, nah, has he not been trying to talk to him for two days? They won't listen to him. So what does he do? He brings them personal pain. So how are they going to respond to that? Verse 7, And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh towards us and Dagon our God. They know who's behind all this. So verse 8, Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of the God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So they carried the ark of Israel away. This was another one of the cities of the Philistines. So they, they got Congress together and they called a meeting and they said, we got a problem here. What are we going to do? What are we going to do in Ashdod? Well, send it to Gath. Sounds like a good government plan, right? Let's not repent. Let's just send it away. And that's exactly what they did. So what happens in verse 9? So it was after they carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he struck the uh, men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of the God to Ekron. So they just keep going to city to city. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. Okay, they're getting the hint, right? So it's in Ashdod. Ashdod, everybody's getting sick and dying. So they move it to, to the next city, which is uh, what um, Ekron, or not Ekron, but um, Gath, thank you, Gath. And everybody's getting sick and dying there. So now we're going to move it to Ekron. Ekron's like, please don't bring it here. Because they got this philosophy that maybe if we get the ark outside of like a cell tower coverage, it'll, the disease will go away. We just move it spot to spot, but everywhere it goes. What is God doing? He is shouting to them in their pain. He is shouting at them. I am the true God. Verse 11, so they sent and gathered together all the lords of the listings and said, send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city and the hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who, died, who did not die were stricken with the tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. This is the sad thing because this is how a lot of people end Number five, men either repent or send God away. Men either repent or send God away. What is the lesson here? You can't run from God. You can't hide from God. All you can do is lift up your eyes and beg for God's mercy. Raise your hands to heaven and ask for God's grace and mercy. And, and I have really good news for you. If you raise your hands to God and ask for his grace and mercy, he will grant it to you. 
But sadly, this, uh, uh, most people, when God's trying to get their attention, it, they, they do one of two things. They either repent and change, or they just they send God away. They, there's this anger towards God. This is what's going on here. We have our God. We don't want this God. But this God has proven itself to be superior over our God. So what are we going to do with that? Are we going to repent and change? No. We just want to send that God away. We like our life the way it is. The sad reality is men would rather suffer than be saved. The sad reality is that people would rather have a God they can control than a God that can save them. It reminds me of a story in Mark chapter 5, and I'll close with this. Remember the story in Mark chapter 5 where, well, let's turn there real quick. So remember, uh, Jesus, most of his ministry was in around Galilee or the Sea of Galilee, One part of Galilee was Jewish occupation. The other part of Galilee was Gentile occupation. So in Mark 5, Jesus goes to the Gentile part of the Sea of Galilee, or on that side of the Sea of Galilee. And they get over there, Remember, and there's this guy there. When they come to the boat, uh, verse number 2, when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. Sounds like our culture, right? We can't tame anybody. We just got to drug them up. So we, we, we have this man who is demon-possessed, and nobody can tame him. And the and the the Gentile people cannot figure out how to contain him. So they tried all of these different methods to tame him, and nothing worked. So they put him in the tombs. They tried to keep him away from the people. But this guy's not in his right mind. So what happens? Verse 6, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the Most High? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So this is the demon speaking to Jesus. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? And he asked him, say, my name is Legion, for we are many. And you guys know the rest of the story. Remember the, So he comes out and he casts them into these pigs. And the pigs then commit, commit universal suicide. So what happens? So the city hears about it and they come out. And listen to what happens in verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Okay, this is good stuff, right? This guy who's tormented the city, who's been a crazy man, who has uh, who has who has run around naked and he's and he's uh, been probably abusive and and tormented people. But now the city comes out. He's sitting down. He's actually clothed and he's in his right mind. And notice how they respond to it. And they were afraid. So what did they do? Verse 16, and, to, and those who saw it told him how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed about the swine. And listen to what it says here in verse 17. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. They said, Jesus, please get out of here. Get, and this is, this is humankind. This is humankind. God speaks to them subtly. God speaks to them powerfully, and God even brings pain on them to get their attention, and men are like, don't want him. Don't want him, don't need him, don't want him in my life. Send him away, send him away. It's a sad story to me. But it just shows the depravity of man. It shows man's thinking. But... We have great hope with Christ, don't we? Yes. We have great hope with Christ. And so my challenge for you is a couple of things. One is, look, is God trying to get your attention? 
Has God been speaking to you in ways outside of the church? Is God trying to get your attention subtly? I mean, he's not, he's not done anything um, He's not done anything bad to you, but you can see there are signs where, man, God's trying to get my attention. Now, I'd listen to him. And I, I'll say this. If you're a child of God and you've experienced the grace of God, are you trying to have multiple gods? Have you taken things that God has given you as gifts and made the gifts greater than the giver of the gifts? There's a lot of miserable Christians. You know why they're miserable? Because they're, they're, they're gifts, they're, they're, they're trying to have multiple gods. I want to serve God, but I want to have this God that I kind of pull out of my, uh, you pull out when I need him. He's like, a, he's like life insurance, you know. God don't like that. He wants to be Lord of all, every part of your life, not just this part or that part. He wants to be Lord of your finances. He wants to be Lord of your home. He wants to be Lord of your sex life. He wants to be Lord of every part of your life. Not just the parts you want to pick and choose. And you may be miserable today because you're, you're trying to have multiple gods and God doesn't work. And God's not going to let you settle for that. So what's he going to do? Going to send subtle messages? He's going to break down these gods that you have. What else is he going to do? He may even bring you pain. The Bible says, for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Listen to him. So what can you do today? Look to heaven and say, I believe. Look to heaven and say, I repent. Please forgive me for trying to have gods above you. You are the true God. They never did this in 1 Samuel. Never. They just sent God away. And what a terrible thing to do, just send God away. Because you really never send God away. He's always there. He's always at work in you. Thank you again for listening to our series on 1 Samuel with Pastor Mark Doss. If you have questions about today's message, please contact our church office at info at TopekaBaptist.org. Give us a call at 785-862-0988 or check us out online at www.topekabaptist.org. 